The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's published by the American Psychiatric Association, and it is intended to be used as a reference book of standard criteria for the classification of mental disorders. Clinicians, researchers, healthcare providers, health insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, policymakers, and even the legal system rely on the DSM as a resource. The DSM works to provide a common language about mental health issues that everyone can use. This book is like an encyclopedia for psychiatry. It groups atypical human behavior in two categories. But we might ask, what is typical behavior? And what is atypical? And how would these behaviors affect the individual and people around them? How we approach these questions and define these categories is very important. It can greatly affect the life of an individual and even our society as a whole. Currently, the DSM is in its fifth edition, which was released in 2013. It is also the first living document version of the DSM. Basically, this means that the DSM is now a digital document that can be continuously revised as the language and research around mental health evolves and changes. Note that the DSM-5 is mainly used in North America, whereas elsewhere in the world, they use the ICD. The ICD-10 is the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, published by the World Health Organization. For now, we'll just focus on understanding the inner workings of the DSM-5. The DSM is divided into three main sections. Section 1 is a relatively simple manual for understanding why the chapters in the rest of the DSM-5 are organized the way they are. This introductory section also explains the process behind how the DSM is revised. It includes a summary of field studies and public and professional reviews. Section 1 also addresses the major revisions in the DSM-5 that distinguishes it from its predecessors. This then leads into Section 2. This section covers the diagnostic criteria and codes. Each chapter in Section 2 represents a broad diagnostic category, such as neurodevelopmental disorders, schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, bipolar and related disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and obsessive-compulsive and related disorders, to name just a few. Finally, Section 3 addresses future directions for research, including emerging models and systems of measure. So how do clinicians in North America use the diagnostic criteria in the DSM to help diagnose a patient? There have been many changes to the diagnostic criteria of the DSM over the years. Many of these changes have focused on how we define atypical behavior and cognition. It's very difficult to define atypical precisely. For example, a behavior that's considered atypical in one culture might be considered typical in another. The DSM attempts to shed some light on this. The first thing that guides the criteria for defining atypical behavior and cognition is whether these behaviors or cognitions are commonly seen in the general population. The second thing that guides the criteria for diagnosis is whether or not these behaviors or cognitions are causing the individual distress. For example, we might ask whether the behaviors in question are preventing this individual from completing daily activities. Questions like this will guide a clinical diagnosis and support for treatment, if needed. However, in the available literature, there is not much known about how clinicians actually use the DSM in practice. There have also been very few studies conducted on this topic. Evidence from studies that have been conducted suggests that clinicians do not methodically apply the diagnostic criteria in the DSM. Rather, it is used more as a guideline, if anything. So, in clinical practice, the main functions of the DSM are firstly to facilitate clinical communication by providing a common language amongst clinicians. Secondly, the DSM's diagnostic criteria provide an entry point into the vast body of research accumulated over the years on psychiatric disorders. So, the DSM-5 is both a powerful tool and yet an imperfect system. Further research and study continues to be conducted, just as this living document continues to be written and revised.